are and you encourage them to be more of it, right? Hey, then what happens is you actually do something and somebody feels better, guess what? Relief. <gasps> you must be okay. I've got some relief coming to see you, right? Stage three is not only did that symptom they came in for, that they looked for relief for, did it get better, but I'm sleeping better. I move easier. I feel younger. I feel more alive. Really. I call that stage recovery. Now guess what? Somebody gets into recovery and they got their life coming back. You know what they're going to do? They're going to start wondering what they really need to do to take care of themselves. And they'll ask questions about exercise and nutrition. They'll ask questions about mattresses and pillows. What do I need to do to take care of myself, right? I call that stage awareness of the requirements for wellness. And people will develop into that stage. Now, I've got to qualify something here real quick because I'm a non-interference person. If you have a rubber band around the finger, it doesn't do any good to, to diagnose and treat the finger until you take the rubber band off, okay? I'm real basic about that. So if somebody asks me a question about nutrition, I create a context. Here's the context. In body chemistry, there's only two areas. It's what my body needs it doesn't have, and what it has it doesn't need. So guess what I just did? I created a chemical balance, deficiency and toxicity, because that's what I need to be well. I'm not waiting for a symptom to develop to, to suggest a nutrient. That's in the intervention model. And so nutraceuticals are just as much intervention as pharmaceuticals. Unless you create that context for non-interference and for deficiency and toxicity. So in stage four, awareness of the requirements for wellness, guess where this conversation fits? It fits here. It doesn't fit over here in faith. It doesn't fit in relief. And you know what? I insult this person if I talk to him about it over here in faith or relief. Did you know that? Not only that, but they may ask me what nutrient they should use for a certain condition. I say, you know, you need to recover a little bit more before we talk about that. See where we're going with that? So stage four is awareness of the requirements for wellness. Stage five, everybody in this room, I really hope you get this loud and clear. There's this power of aliveness, this life force, right? We have. And there's interference too. Do you know that a bad relationship interferes with that? Do you know that a bad job interferes with it, right? Okay. Do you know that toxic environments interfere with it? Okay. So guess what? In stage five, people have lost a correction, have less life, get a correction, have more life, and guess what? They got the non-interference message experientially, not ideologically. Here. Somebody picks it up experientially, guess what your job is? They're going to come into your office and you're going to say, <clears throat> good to see you, what kind of trouble are you having? My spine's out. Any symptoms? Yeah, just correct it. Right? Here's an ideal patient. Doesn't want to talk to you about what their problem is, just wants you to fix it. Just correct my spine because it limits my life. So stage seven is that stage where that's a lifetime patient and they get the principle of non-interference and they're going to come to you to have the interference removed from their life. In stage seven is when I see relationships change, people change jobs, some people move towns. I mean, just all kinds of things happen once they really do integrate this whole idea of more life and less life. It's a pretty basic thing to do. So how does the upper cervical world fit into this? The upper cervical world fits into this by the ability to truly correct that spine back to normal leave it alone as long as it stays. I've now been adjusted five times since November 2000 and my spine is in line as I speak to you today. You can probably tell by the clarity that I have. I'm an old guy. I've been practicing 42 years. I'll be pretty beat up by now, don't you think? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'm still chairing the research board for NUCA, chairing the NUCA Educational Board, chairing the Council for Upper Cervical Care that created the Diplomate Program for Upper Cervical. I'm getting ready to, I'm actually a, one of the partners that's creating the upper cervical event next year in New Orleans on February 26th through the 28th. 
I'm still practicing four days a week. And last July, I damn near died with a heart condition. <clears throat> last time I visited my cardiologist, he saw me for checked in six months. Okay? Had no surgeries, had no ablation, no other procedures. I just went back inside at N8 through take care of myself and heal. Okay? That's our paradigm. It works. It'll work for you, it'll work for the people you take care of. But I do recommend making sure that you can get that spine corrected and stable. Now the future of chiropractic. You guys are the future of chiropractic when sitting here in this room. You know, I've got some years left and I'm certainly going to make the best of everything I've got left. But as you guys come into this profession, take on leadership. Really take on leadership. Just by sitting in this room, you've probably evolved into one of those higher developmental stages. And so that mantle of leadership is creating some sort of direction or guidance for our profession because it's fundamental to us not to lose in aid and educate. It's fundamental to us not to lose non-interference. It's fundamental to us not to continue to pursue the absolute correction of the misaligned spine have it stable for as long as someone lives with as few adjustments as possible. Will there be challenges? Absolutely. Will there be times you feel like you're beating your head against a brick wall? Absolutely. Yes. Question. I was going to ask, as far as you were speaking about how there's all these differences with the general public, even among chiropractors, I don't know what you're saying about challenges and um, I guess chiropractors move some school uh, move into more chiropractic style to be. What do you say to that, or how do you address that when you have such a clear cut difference in the chiropractic? Group? probably going to backdoor that in just a little bit. But I'm going to remain true to myself, and I'm going to carry that forward as far as I can take it. You know, will you be strong enough not to succumb to the pressures of your profession and your culture? That's the real question. Because those pressures have been in our profession from the very beginning. They're not new. <coughs> Every time somebody tries to push it this way, somebody else pushes it back. Every time somebody tries to push it this way, somebody pushes it back. There are a lot of really difficult questions in your question that you're posing. If I were to say that chiropractic as a healthcare profession and medicine, dentistry, if I would say there's an island on which healthcare exists that people come to the island, one of the problems is chiropractic until recently did not have a beachhead. We had our own little island. And so the real key for us is to be able to integrate in an objective way so that we can gain a beachhead on that big island of healthcare. Now, none of us want to be a part of it. You've got to get that. I don't want to be a part of that because it's a failure system. But I'm going to tell you that until we have that beachhead established, based on, on what we know to be true, and that is that a misaligned spine affects the health and well-being of the individual, okay, we're not going to have a place in that island. And until we can document that with the research that's going on, and ongoing research, I mean, we're underfunded, we're under staff, and all of those things are true, but that, for me, is what has to happen now. Does that mean that they're not a faction of our profession that to get that beachhead are willing to sell out? Yes, they are. Okay, and remember, I said earlier, no one can be 100% wrong. Okay, when I was seven years old, my next door neighbor gave me a box of 200 pieces of barrel bubble gum. By the time I'm 10, I have 27 cavities. It is too late to go back and remove the bubble gum. You got me? I need intervention. I'm one of those people that believes that intervention is also necessary. There is a place for it. It's not going to provide health and wellness, but there is a place for intervention. Okay? And we need to make sure that we're clear about that too. So 
by the time we take on that beachhead, we're the non-interference people. We're the people that facilitate things working better, not just the people treating those conditions. That's me there. That's, those are big steps, really big steps. <clears throat> Our upper cervical program in New Orleans is going to be based on the idea that our time is coming. Are you ready? What we want to do is prepare people to be ready. Okay? Get the strength of that? I, I get it. See, that's, that's why it's easy for me because... Goosebumps. Yeah, yeah there's definitely some of us that are, that are ready. But my, my idea is to, to get those that are not on board with what you're saying. Um, not going to happen. They live in a state of, of development that's intervention based. And everybody in this room, you're going to be faced with these challenges. So I'm going to tell you what they are. The first three to five years of your practice life, one of the challenges you're going to have is I want the big business. Right? Anybody here already got that? If you will, and you're going to have a lot of people advocating it for you. Got to have the big business. Okay? <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Okay? And guess what? It's okay to have a big business. Right? My thing is to take care of the leaders in my community, the decision makers, the people that can make a difference all the way through. And I can't do that practicing in jeans and a t shirt. Okay? I don't wear these clothes. I like I like dressing up, it's just my deal. But you got you get my drift here? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I'm on the advisory board of Tulsa Ballet, one of the top ten ballets in America. I'm in the Master Society of Philbrook Museum. I take care of the people on the board of directors of my bank. I take care of half of the board of directors of the University of Tulsa. I take care of the president of the junior college system and thirty two thousand students. That's who I'm after, and I'm after the ability to communicate to those people in a way that causes them to be a lifetime patient and have their whole family be lifetime patients. So you're looking for all of that? Quality. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't really give a shit what the guys are doing with around the intervention. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna be true to myself. I'm not gonna leave that true. Either on the path or not. Yeah, and if they're not, it's okay, it's okay with me. I mean, there's a lot of people that are not going to take care of themselves health-wise. You know, so there's a lot of people that are not prospects for chiropractic patients. They could care less if, you know, they live short and die young. A lot of people just like that. You know, I talk to people about in Oklahoma, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Right? I say, well, really what you mean is hard work and good food. Yeah. <laughs> And so just give them the person a break, right? Yeah. Because until you give somebody a break, they can't move. If I make people wrong, they can't move. Okay? And what happens is a lot of those very people that you're talking about, when their own personal health crisis occurs, find somebody like the people in this room that can remove that interference and help them get their life back. Help. I think you brought up uh, a really good point in talking to the stage that people are in, but just because they're in a lower stage than you are, it doesn't mean that you can't communicate to them or that one day they might not be open to it. So I think part of us as being in the upper cervical is not to discount people and where they are in their stage and being open so, to them. We need and to, I think we need to bring it we back We need to, to that. thank them because that was an evolutionary stage of chiropractic. Yeah. Yes. For another thing, Adam says that you shouldn't talk down to somebody. No. Yeah, and expressing some sort of anybody that knows me very well, and I, there are not a lot of people in this room that see me at conferences, but if <clears throat> I go to a conference and I have to have CE credits in Oklahoma, some of them have to be in Oklahoma, right? Well, there aren't any upper cervical classes that are in Oklahoma for CE credits, so I have to go to the classes with all the folks that are doing all kinds of things to this fine. I'm the guy that stands out in the hall watching people do all this stuff. I'm still curious. Still curious how all that happens. It's <laughs> okay. so, curious. <clears throat> so, has this been fun? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to.
going to do my shameless plug now. But Taking Care of People is a class that I've been teaching for 15 years, and it is based on the idea of asking patients questions and then uh, having say ask patients if there are any questions and having answers to those questions built in. So there's eight contexts, one of which is the miscellaneous spine, one is the distribution of nerves. We go through the lifetime stages, we go through points of resistance people have to care. But we do a, a new patient all the way from beginning to lifetime, uh, on a Saturday afternoon to where you're going to get the entire model. If you have an upper cervical practice, any of you are going to do that. This is really good for you because what you're going to need to know is you're going to need to know the recovery stages people go through. Because a lot of people are doing case plans these days, and if you're doing a case plan for a new patient in an upper cervical procedure for six months, you are kidding yourself. A lot of the, those people will drop out before they're finished. But if you're doing three months to do an initial intensive so that you've got to monitor it and make sure that it stays, even if you only have to adjust it once, you're going to check it for three months, and then it takes six to eight months for ligaments and tendons to go through the first phase of recovery, guess when spines start to get really stable in about six to eight months? So you're going to have three months of kind of monitoring, then you're going to have a pretty good idea what it's going to do, then you're going to go out to six to eight months. It takes a month to recover for every year the spines are misaligned, and that's what we call maximum recovery. That's where you're going to get as good as you're going to get. Somebody that's 40 years old is going to be two or three years to go into maximum recovery. You need to know that going into practice. If you don't know that, you're making it up as you go, and you're you're going to take the same 15 to 20 years everybody took to figure it out. No point reinventing the wheel. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you then the basics on how that occurs. You know, I'm going to give you office procedures. The manual for my taking care of people class now is 100 pages long. It's 100 pages in front of back. <clears throat> so it's got office procedures, it's got hiring procedures, it's got staffing procedures, it's got related leadership skills of the doctor, it's got, leader, it's got how, how, how to actually select staff. Um, probably, Shelly is the only person in this room that's been in that class before, is that correct? Oh, yay. Yeah, and I actually use it in clinic all the time. We got this really awesome binder, and I refer to it like weekly. For just like different things, like a patient's not getting it, and I go back to it, I'm like, okay, I need to go through this, and this, this. So it's super, super helpful. I love that binder. I have people that tell me that, you know, they've been in practice 10 years and they still say I use your material every single day that I'm patient. So, anyway, that's kind of what I'm here to do. Again, I took a, I took a year off, so I haven't been here. I don't remember what I did in class here last one. Was that January year? January last year. Early last year? Last, last year. January. Yeah. January. Okay. So, and, you know, I would like to come back and do the class like every six months or so. Because I've been here for a while, I'm probably going to have a real small class. And uh, that's really dangerous because you're up, up close and personal with me for, for two days. <laughs> yeah. But it's a lot of experiential, too. I'm going to have you learn how to do this stuff, not just present it to you. So you get to work with other people and you get to, to interact. And so the communication skills, relationship skills, um, there's actually some marketing pieces in there. There's how to run an office, everything you need to do to do that. Uh, we can discuss floor plans and how to make things flow in a practice. So there's, there's just a tremendous amount of material. And then the last part of it is personal development, and that's creating the practice of your dream. So we go into personal values and vision and mission and identity and some things you need to really create the practice of your dreams. I had someone retake the class here a couple of months ago. She took her first class about two months before she graduated from Parker, and she had hired a consultant, fired the consultant, called me and asked me if I'd work with her. So we instituted the procedures, and she took the class again this last time, and um, you know, just again, it woke everything up for her. So it's one of those things that's there. Now, there's another piece of this too, because everybody remembers, that, and I, I want to close in a few minutes with the rest of this, but at the end of, take care of people class, I do another class called Issues in the Tissues. And this is not something that you want to practice and it's not chiropractic. It's something you need to know. So fundamentally, if there's little kids running around playing and one of them falls and skins a knee, somebody with a safe and loving relationship can pick them up and hold them up, just like this, and they would cry and cry and cry and cry and then they go, 
and they jump up and go play like you didn't ever have it. Let's see each other that. That's the healing response. You know what the opposite response is? Oh, shit, what are you doing running around? I told you not to run here. What were you thinking? You know what the child does? Okay. The repressions and suppressions are issues in the tissues, and they can be very critical in patient care because there are the things that are caused by spinal misalignments that if you can truly correct one, will go away. There are things that are related to, like if my knee's injured and my spine's out of line, my knee's worse, spine in line, knee's better, knee's still injured. And there are things that don't relate at all. And so until you can truly correct the spine back to normal, it's very difficult to establish which one of those three things you're working on. Issues in the tissues, and some of these fibromyalgia classically, some people have misdiagnosed and all they have is a spinal misalignment, but some people that have a spinal misalignment and a chemical imbalance and toxicity and deficiency will also have issues in the tissues and sometimes being able to release some pain that someone's carrying will still have them to pop right out. Okay? It's another piece of interference, not chiropractic. I don't teach you the class so that you know how to do it. I just teach you the class so you know that it's there. And I do that as a bonus for anybody that takes, this, that takes taking care of people class. And it's about an hour and a half to two hours. And create a context for the misaligned spine now in about three to five minutes. I connect just about anybody with it. It takes me about an hour and a half to do the context for that. Just because it's kind of out of your frame. Now, I'm going to go ahead and close. And as soon as I close, then we'll uh, get out of here for the day. Um, I want to just establish the pathway to greatness because the pathway to greatness is the ability to take that educated mind and put it in second position. But there's a life force that's in all of us. And the distinction is that force, because we use that word in chiropractic, is a little bit dangerous. Because the ego of the human uses force to survive. The innate, powerful, it's like gravity, it exists, you drop something, it falls, it's always there. That power is always there. And it's different than force that we use to survive. And even though it's appropriate to be able to use both of those, the pathway to greatness is to surrender to innate. Surrender to innate. Over and over and over again. As we begin to surrender to any, then life takes on more fullness, more depth, and more meaning. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. It's been really fun.